Hello, thank you for joining us at the third annual The Lofts Wordplay Book Festival. Virtual Wordplay is a presentation of St. Catherine University and Star Tribune. My name is Tarsha Stanley, and I'm the Dean of Humanities, Arts, and Sciences at St. Catherine University here in St. Paul, Minnesota. We want to take a moment before we begin to acknowledge that the state of Minnesota is located on the traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of indigenous people. The loft and open book are built within the homelands of the Dakota people. The loft recognizes the original peoples of this place and affirm tribal sovereignty. A few housekeeping things before we get started. You will be able to ask our author questions by clicking on the ask a question feature. The event will be recorded and you're welcome to access this event at, many, at any time until June 1st. So as many times as you would like until June 1st. And please purchase Sorrowland using the link below. And also please take time to fill out the survey you'll receive at the end of this session. It helps us know how to program the events you want to see. And now let me introduce our esteemed author. River Solomon, River Solomon writes about life in the margins where they are much at, where they are much at home. In addition to appearing on the Stonewall Honor List and winning a Firecracker Award, Solomon's debut novel, An Unkindness of Ghosts, was a finalist for a Lambda, a Hurston Wright, and otherwise, formerly known as Tiptree, and a Locus Award. Solomon's second book, The Deep, based on the Hugo-nominated nominated song by Dobby Diggs and his hip-hop group Clipping, was the winner of the 2020 Lambda Award and shortlisted for a Nebula, Locus, Hugo, Ignite, Brooklyn Library Literary, British Fantasy, and World Fantasy Award. Solomon's short work appears in or is forthcoming from Black Warrior Review, The New York Times, The New York Times Magazine, Guernica, Best American Short Stories, Tor.com, Best American Horror and Dark Fantasy, and elsewhere. A refugee of the transatlantic slave trade, Solomon was born on Turtle Island but currently resides on an isle in an archipelago off the western coast of the Eurasian continent. So welcome to River Solomon. Thank you so much, Tasha. You are more than welcome. I'm very <laughs> excited to talk to you about your book today. It's absolutely awesome. I tend to read things that haunt me, and this is no exception, uh, but it goes on my, my list of books that I have to come back to over and over and over again. So I appreciate the fact that I got to read it. I want to begin just a little bit uh, by talking about you as a writer before we uh, sort of delve into the novel itself. So can you talk a little bit about why you write? Why do you feel like writing is the, the, the one thing you want to do to express yourself? Yeah, well, for as long as I can remember, I've always been that kid with, you know, head in the clouds, always deep in my imagination, making things up, wanting to kind of live in a fantasy land. Um, I had a, like a whole period where I, when I was a kid where I used to take my lunch to school with a bandana tied to a stick because I just had this idea of, you know, I was this person on a journey um, and, you know, different things like that. I just, I like what imagination can do for us. I think it creates possibility. I think it creates fun, but it also, you know, can help us tangle with real questions um, that, you know, we, that challenge us in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, so yeah, I, I'm definitely one of those people. There's kind of that spectrum of always wanted to be a writer to discover it kind of later in life. And I'm definitely one of those people who wanted to be a, a writer from very early on. Um, and yeah, it has, you know, thankfully and wonderfully worked out that I get to do this. Um, and, you know, in, in any world, I think I would be compelled to tell stories and make things up and find liberation in making things up. Yeah. Thank you for that. You know, I, I was reading reviews of your work and many people refer to it as um, that it doesn't fit in any particular genre, that it really crosses many genres. How do you describe your work overall? I, I use different words like every year, kind of, I don't know, I mean, who knows? Words, words are tricky like that and difficult and like, 
you have to um, navigate that line between trying to communicate something that people will understand. So people will hear that word and think, oh yes, that's, I recognize what that is. And that's what I want to read. Um, while also kind of trying to stay true to the work as well and what it's doing. Um, so I think generally I use the word speculative um, to describe my work. So speculative is a very sort of broad category of anything that is slightly askew with reality. That's how I think of it. So it, it includes things like science fiction and fantasy, but it also includes, you know, fabulism and things that have a folkloric feel or a slightly mythological feel. Um, it would, I think, include things like magical realism from the magical realist tradition um, and all of those things. So that's that's the word that I, I tend to use to describe my work. Um, even though that doesn't actually describe all of my work, because I do occasionally write things that are straight realist. Um, so far, not um, any novels, but a lot of my shorter work, um, you know, doesn't necessarily have a speculative element. So, yeah, but genre is hard. I just want to basically I think about things in terms of the story, like and how I want to make people feel um, and what kind of experience I want them to have, which is to be sort of full of both like wonder and curiosity. And I want them readers to feel like driven, like that kind of, you know, I need to know what's going on, that impulse. Yeah, I, I, I love your work, particularly as an English professor. You know, I can't read anything without thinking about how I would introduce it to my students. And so I always want them to be reading with, um, nowadays, Google, <laughs> or a dictionary, but I, I want them to, I want it to be a process for them. I want them to be involved. I want them to come across words they don't know. I want yeah. them to have to look it up. I want them to have to go do research. And I, I just was so fascinated by your novel because I thought, ah, oh, this is exactly it. This is what I want them to engage in. So I, I'm so appreciative of it. I, um, my background is in speculative fiction. I do work on Octavia Butler. Mm -hmm. and so just trying to think about how to introduce that to students who, um, don't, don't know they actually live in a speculative world. They haven't really sort of thought about it very much, but once they're introduced to the literature, just fall in love. Yeah. And so I'm just so excited to introduce my students to, to your work. It's gonna be really fabulous to have them read this and, and, and some of your other work as well. So I want to ask a little bit now about Sorrowland and um, just, just thinking about, you know, Vern is such an incredible character. Um, what, when you work, constructing Vern was did did the character ever sort of get away from you were there things about Vern that ended up surprising you as the be, because the character is so multi-dimensional and so human you know that is what I love about Vern is that there's no way to sort of pigeonhole her because there she represents many things yeah I think it's hard to say because in so many ways, she sort of came to me um, very much with a very strong voice, um, with a, a strong personality. And I think that strong personality is kind of in a lot of ways what ends up driving um, the story. So Vern, the book starts out where she's living in the woods. She's recently run away um, from the community where she grew up. And I just think about the 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 start of the book or of her story is with this rebellion, with this leaving. So I have to think about, okay, who is she? She's someone who has to be incredibly brave um, and also a bit defiant um, and all of these things. And I also think about the fact that, okay, she's, all, I think, I think she's quite an empowered character in so many ways, but I think about all of the ways that she's also very, very vulnerable. Um, and those I think were the things that came most as a surprise. Like she's very young when she starts the book, she's only 15 years old. Um, she, she really doesn't have that much power over her life um, and how it's happened so far. And um, she's, you know, a teenager who, you know, has whims and is discovering herself and finding out what she believes. Um, and, you know, sometimes that means making mistakes and, um, you know, in doing that. So I think like 
working with that, this, the fact that she's this incredibly, you know, super intense person who can get a lot done. She gets a lot done. Um, <laughs> but also reckoning with the fact that, you know, she's been hurt and she lives with that hurt inside of her. And, and those moments of gentleness and vulnerability, um, I think were, were things that when I found them coming out on the page um, were really important and actually, you know, got me into her character. Mm -hmm. I, um, I, I'm trying so hard not to give away um, lots of parts. <laughs> oh, I know. This book is, it's so hard to talk. In it doing is. these events, and it's just like, <laughs> it's so hard to talk about it without spoilers. <laughs> it's so hard. It is so true. I, I have to say, though, that it, there was a point where I had to put the book down and walk away. Uh, <laughs> Um, and it's sort of like the leaping from tree to tree to tree. And I just thought, oh, don't we do that every day in our lives yeah. in terms of just survival? Yeah. I, I loved the the metaphorical ways in which, um, you know, sort of reading the text and reading the character uh, brought to mind the kinds of things that we might think are speculative in this world, but actually we do every day. So I really yes. appreciated that. Yeah, and that's the beauty of speculative fiction, right? Like it does just speak so much to our lives and it can like shine a light on things in a way um, that, you know, aren't, you know, otherwise clear or that it can make it more clear when we see them see through that way. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So are, are there things about the novel that, that bring you great satisfaction? <laughs> when you finish, um, I achieved what I wanted to. Um, it's so hard to answer that question because there's always that like, you know, I've, I, I, when I do, when I've been doing readings, I'm like, oh, I wish I had done this slightly different. Um, it's always kind of feels like a work in progress, but yeah, I mean, I think I wanted a nuanced picture of different types of relationships. So there are a lot of, I think, really interesting mother-child relationships in the book um, that really spoke to me. And um, I'm, I'm, some, I'm really, really close to my mother. I'm really, really, I was really, really close to my grandmother who has passed um, and all of my like aunts and stuff. And, um, but there are also tensions, just like there are tensions, you know, in every relationship. And when you have, when everybody has their own stuff that they're dealing with, um, how it can, you know, sometimes break down relationships or make them not as loving or as perfect as they could be. So I wanted to really, really tangle with that in the book. And um, Vern, the protagonist, has children. Um, and then, you know, there's a relationship with her own mother. Um, and, and her mother, it's not a huge part of the book, but there's a little bit about sort of her relationship with her parents and the sort of aunt and uncle that she ended up living with um, and stuff like that. So that was something that I was really pleased with how that turned out, or I felt good about it. Um, what else? I like Vern. I think she's pretty awesome. Uh, she's fun, um, you know. She's very angry and, you know, opinionated and um, full of intensity and wildness. And I love that. Mm -hmm. um, and I loved the, the you, you sort of spoke about sort of when you are thinking about books and teaching, like, you know, there's that, you, you, you know, thinking about different words and stuff and want there to be things that challenge. And like, for me, like writing is also kind of, has to be a learning experience. Like I have to sort of change and grow as I'm writing. And so I learned about so much and I'm really, I learned so much about, you know, nature and wildlife um, and all of those things. And I felt much of the work was a process of me trying to feel more connected um, to the earth and in, in our ecology and as opposed to sort of separate or on top of it as a ruler. And that was really interesting to me to do. And I felt like I, 
I've managed well. So I don't think it's too much of a spoiler to say, you know, the book starts in the woods and it kind of ends in the woods yeah. too. So mm -hmm. that's a great segue to a question about place. Because you know, as you, you know, the land, the woods, I mean, it's, it's a character itself, really. And you know, I think the same was true for your book, The, the Deep, The Sea is a character. And yeah. so what is it that you're doing when you, you sort of personify the land, the sea, the air? Yeah. What, what is it that you want your audience to, to engage in those moments? I think seeing our surroundings and our settings is not just backdrops for us to play out our own dramas. Like they're alive and vibrant and ancient as well, often years and years old with stories and with different peoples connected to them and different animals and all of these things. Um, and we are sort of just one part of this grand system. Um, so that's something that, that, but also there's this element of thinking about like fairy tales and how this, you know, the, the sort of the idea of the dark woods, you know, that you go into and what's gonna happen there. Um, I think that there's something that can be quite primal about that um, and really speak, you know, speak to us. Um, and, the woods in, in Sorrowland and also the ocean and the deep are both things that I think are full of darkness and terror, but they're also full of life and rebirth. And so thinking about all of those things, I think are really important themes of each of their stories. Um, and is also just part of the grander like human story and animal story and um, yeah. I really loved um, sort of the land as a character. And I love the contrast between the woods and when Vern and her children sort of go into a different space. And um, yeah. you even remember to think about what it would be like to wear shoes. Like the yeah. detail is just so incredibly important. Like, have you been in this space in which you've been at such, you know, um, you know you're, you're so symbiotic with the woods and then all of a sudden you're on concrete. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. I, that was the stuff I loved writing and like, and that was the learning. Like, I really wanted to put myself in there and what is it, you know, we're all shaped by our geography and our surroundings. And so I really had to try to take off my, you know, I didn't, I did not grow up in the woods. Um, and um, I grew up in sort of various urban and or suburban settings kind of mixed. And um you know, and that, you know, you tend to see everything through that lens and it's just natural to you. It's whatever you grew up with, that just, that's what life is. That's what it feels like. That's what's right. And so I had to really, you know, put on my, a different set of lenses um, to think about what life would be like um, and to really, really feel a part of, you know, these, these natural spaces. And I always struggle with exactly kind of what words to use. Um, but yeah, like with the woods, with dirt, with trees, you know, with plants um, and what it would be like to have, you know, a very intuitive relationship with them, you know, which I don't, I can't walk along and identify most trees or plants that I, walk by and Vern can do that. Vern is, you know, partially blind and can still do that because she has this, you know, she's grown up with it. She has this fluidity and the children grow up with the same level of, you know, um, this, this relationship where it's just natural. It's like knowing what this is and how to, what to do with this plant is, you know, intuitive to them as, you know, like when I was a kid, you know, um, I, I, you know, I knew what the, the golden arches meant. It's like, yes, we're having McDonald's tonight, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I understand. Uh, you know, having, I have a very rural background. And so, so much mm. of it took me home in terms of, you know, having grown up um, in the woods, that's where we played, that's having to understand certain things about your, your surroundings, how to be one yeah. with it, but also how to be wary of it mm -hmm. at the same time. So I, I really appreciated those moments. Um, the land too, you choose to introduce uh, indigenous characters in yeah. the and, and their relationship with the land. You, you are definitely asking your readers to do something with that. Yeah, 
Mm -hmm. I mean, so the, the book is called Sorrowland and it's about, you know, the United States as a sort of occupying force on this land and what it has done to it and how it's, you know, full of sorrow. And I feel like I couldn't talk about the land and talk, talk about that land without having indigenous characters. Um, it just wouldn't make any sense or it would feel like a really big erasure. So, um, yeah, um, I think as far as what do I, what I wanted to do with it, I think the main thing about the book in general, I think is what I, I want people to challenge assumptions, I guess, and relationships of power. Um, and I think that, you know, that comes, you know, and when we when we talk about the land too, and the idea of who owns the land or who cares for the land or is in a relationship with the land, and it's important to me to acknowledge the historical relationship that various indigenous peoples have with the land, uh, and as stewards of this land, um, and you know definitely uh, you know a sense of, you know, wanting to return sovereignty, you know, to, to indigenous people. So, yeah. And I, I love that acknowledgement. And I love that there was a partnership between people of African descent and indigenous people, because there is, I don't think that we always um, approach it in that way. So it was good to see it in that book to think about these very different experiences, but in many ways that are the same in sorrow land and to yeah. see that acknowledged and to see a coalition and a relationship and a family built. Yes, yes. Now I'm so glad that you brought that up because um, when I think about sort of our various political movements and the movement building that we've done historically, and I do think coalition building has been an important part of um, work that we've done and mm -hmm. um, you know, learning from each other and all of these things. And I also wanted to show it though on a very um, personal level too. Like when you talk about that idea of family and building a family and there is an aspect of themes of found family um, to this work. And one of the things, and it's, it's not a small, I mean, it's not a big part, but um, you know, for, for Vern, she feels very alienated from her family and her background um, and, you know, can't really sort of imagine the idea of sort of being loyal to this, the idea of a nation or people necessarily in the same way that Gogo, who is, um, you know, one of the indigenous characters in the book, who feels very... Um, cheated in, a, in ways that, you know, that she was taken off um, the res where, you know, her, where, where she was born, but didn't get to live and feeling sort of disconnected and feeling still very loyal to family and this idea of um, nation and stuff like this. And I don't know, I think that we all have these like very real not just like on a like, oh, black people have this, you know, indigenous people have this and so on have this, but on a personal level, we all have our various chips on our shoulders, things that we're going through and, you know, whatever. Um, and how do we build connection over those differences and love each other and find wholesome ways to love each other and care about each other? Mm -hmm. I, I loved um, the Gogo -Go character and that you, you know, that her relationship to the reservation having left it so early was very different from her aunt. Who, who yeah. took her from. But they had yeah. very different ways that they saw that same experience. Yeah. And the same thing happens with Vern and her mother that we experience the exact same things, but we yeah. see them in such very different ways. And lenses yeah. and sight are so important in the text, you know, and, yeah. and, and the fact that uh, Vern, does have trouble seeing, you know, in the ways that we think of sight, you know, our yeah. first reaction to sight. Why, why make a character who, um, you know, has uh, vision problems? I think mostly that wasn't like a, a specifically sort of deliberate choice beyond, you know, 
some people um, have low vision, some people are blind. And um, I think um, Vern being albino was something that came very early. Um, I think part of it was because some of the, the, the mythos of um, Caneland had a sort of very fetishistic relationship with albino black people. Um, and I think I might've been, um, I don't know if I was in, I, it's hard to actually remember the, mm -hmm. the way things went, but inspired by, you know, various stories um, of that. And so, and, you know, it's, it's, so that came first and then it's, it's very common, um, you know, when you have albinism to, to have vision problems. And so, but it also, I think it, when we think about our senses and we also think about different ways of being disabled or enabled by our bodies, um, I think it's always a refreshing way to sort of rethink how we look at the world and how we experience life and how it um, influences our perceptions. Um, and yeah, so I think it, just like with sort of any detail of a person, because we're all so rich and complicated, I think, um, I, I think it adds, you know, just, I mean, just as anything about anyone kind of adds because it's more, it's Vern's part of her harness, you know, it's part of what makes Vern Vern. Mm -hmm. and, and Vern ends up, I think, really being able to see better than anyone around her because she knows, for instance, that things in Caneland are not what they yes. see, you know? Yeah, no, thank you for, for saying that because one experience that I have had, and I think others have this too, when you feel like an outsider and some in, in one way or another, there's lots of ways to, to, to be somehow marked as different or outside of the norm. Um, I do think it can sometimes crack open the facade a little bit when you have that, when you're a little, you're just a little bit outside of it. Um, and for Vern, that's, yes, that that's absolutely the case that she sees, you know, kind of a little bit behind the veil a bit of what this really is. Um, yeah, I like the way you put that, that was nice. Yeah, mm -hmm. she yeah. does see. <laughs> better, better than all the folks around her, really. Um, yeah. And, you know, I love, I love the way Vern sees her children, you know, so her twins are just absolutely awesome and, and that they're very different personalities, but they're both very much her, you know, yeah. so these expressions of who she is and, and the children. So what, what is it, why, why twins and, and what were you thinking in terms of, cause you, cause you, cause you're invoking, I think a lot of that, um, um, traditional mythology around twins, around a yeah, so absolutely. Yeah, I think, well, part of it is just that when I was writing this book, um, I was very deep into all of my like sort of parenthood. You know, I have two children. Um, it's just this intense um, sort of totalizing experience, um, or it was. And so on some levels, it was a simply practical. I wanted to write about having two children. I have two children. And I was like, okay, well, timing wise, it makes sense to do twins. <laughs> um, so there's that, there's that, that very basic. But also I think, yeah, I mean, I think twins have a lot of sort of um, mythological sort of mm -hmm. power and like cultural resonance. And there are a lot of sort of things that we think about twins. And I think, um, and I think this, especially in terms of sort of different sort of African and African, African diasporic, you know, religious beliefs and practices and things like that. Um, and I think duality is something, you know, they're very different. And the, I think, one one of the two children is more kind of angry, I guess. Um, and the other is a little bit, you know, a bit sweeter and a bit sort of more loving and adventurous and how these things can exist side by side. Um, and I think these are two things that exist 
side by side within Vern, um, and we get to see them kind of expressed in this way uh, through the children, um, who I love dearly. Yes, I, I can tell. And, and I think what I loved about them too is that usually with twins, they're either going to be exactly alike or they're going to be these diametrically opposed, you know, polar mm -hmm. opposites. And so as I was reading, I was a little bit afraid. I was like, oh no, <laughs> is one going to dominate the other one? <laughs> but what I loved was that it was just this expression of, of, it was who they needed to be in each moment. There's a moment in which I, I think she says to Howling, um, be kind, but always mm -hmm. fight. Yeah. And there's a moment in which Beryl says to his mother, um, would you like my sleeve? Because he sees her tears. Yeah. Like, you, can, you, can, you can cry on me. And I just thought, I loved it. I was like, oh, I love these yeah. children. And, um, you know, but they were both just such great expressions of those two, I think, sides that are in all of us, right? Yeah. That, you know, that who we all are we just don't allow ourselves to have particular expressions or we get that particular expression it, it tries to be moderated in a particular way yes um, yeah yeah so and I think also because they're children you have less of that moderation that you know and especially because they've grown up in the woods they you know don't have a strong sense of oh I need to be this way um to to fit in you know they don't you know like, all they have to do is fit in with the trees and the and the and the squirrels and so on so um it, they have that yeah and I think that it's interesting to see the way that for Van the way that seeing them grow up and how they are like is an intense experience for her as well um, as a mother. Um, I don't necessarily have anything like more interesting to say about that, but I just think it's like, you know, and, and it, it is like when we're, all of our relationships affect us and, you know, make us grow and challenge us. So mm -hmm. there's definitely some of that with her relationship with the kids. Mm -hmm. I thought it was beautiful. And memory plays such an important part in your work overall, yeah. I think. Um, in the in Sorrowland, though, you know, I think Vern ends up still being a memory bearer. Yeah. In many ways, and so what is it that that keeps bringing you sort of back to that theme? Because that that also happens in the deep in a particular yeah. way. Yeah, yeah, it does, and and it's less um, apparent um, in my first book, but that's also in an unkindness of ghosts. It's also a, there's also a strong theme of memory and remembering and sort of unraveling history um, in there too. So I don't know, I think part of it is just being a bit obsessed with it because of the ways that, how I've felt it lacking in my own life and the idea of the sort of immense loss created by the transatlantic crossing and, you know, the genocide of my people and aspects of my culture and people and all of that stuff um, really, you know, weighs on me really heavily. And this idea of being able to find ways still to connect to that really speak to me um, and draw me. Um, and I think, I think I'm someone who lives like slightly out of time. Like I, I'm always deep in my memories. I'm always thinking about the past in a way that's very vivid and flush in me. And I think it's had an impact. And um, so I like, I'm drawn to writing characters who also have this, um, this kind of experience and what it's like. And I think it's also just kind of a metaphor for trauma. Like one of, I think the big things about having experienced trauma is the way that no matter how much time has passed, it can, you can still just go back to that space really quickly. And sometimes that's in a very obvious way, like a flashback, but I think all of us every day are kind of living with the influence of you know, not just like, oh, specific, terrible or violent things that have happened to us, but the effect of living in a world that's, you know, full of inequality and prejudice and subjugation and all of these things. And, you know, I, I think we all have these little traumas inside of us and it affects us and it's always with us. So I think there's kind of a metaphor for that in there as well. Mm -hmm. I think um, 
too, that, you know, your language is so beautiful. And um, certainly you are a writer who loves words. I mean, I think there are many people who write who don't necessarily like words. <laughs> and so I just wanted to share, this is on page 215, it's a very short section, but I, I think it's so powerful, particularly talking about trauma. And as the sun rose, she lamented her necessary return to the cabin where she'd been forced to confront her inadequacies. The forest didn't mind illiterates and mad girls didn't mind that screaming was sometimes a person's only language. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And that, I just thought, wow, isn't that true? And there are many moments in the book in which you draw those, um, draw us to, the, to an understanding of trauma in yeah. a way in which you, the, the reader has to think, how could it not work itself out except in that way? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank, and thank you for sharing that, um, that quote, too. Um, yeah, I, I love that. I love language as a medium um, and the way that it can, it bridges the gaps between us. It can bridge the gaps between us sometimes and um, can get to the kind of heart of the matter. Um, and you know, sometimes I think what's funny, what's what's ironic about it is that trauma specifically is kind of beyond language sometimes, and it can be very, it's very, it lives in our kind of lizard brain a bit. Um, but so being able to find a way to sort of mine it out and put it in sort of ways that we can discuss and talk about feels really powerful. Mm -hmm. And words in many ways can create a container for it, if only for a little while. Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. Um, because I think, I talk a little bit about naming in the book, but I do think, and I, I don't really subscribe to the idea of like naming necessarily giving us power over things, but it certainly empowers us, you know, um, and you know, gives us a way of navigating the relationship. Um, so between us and what we've gone through uh, or what we're experiencing. Um, so like, like words like, that's why words like black or disabled or queer, you know, have these meanings because they can sort of bridge these, these gaps between what's going on inside and, um, you know, how do we make sense of it all? Mm -hmm. We're, we're, we're at the point at which I invite the audience members to go ahead and put their questions um, to, so that we can, so they get a chance to, to talk to you a little bit through the questions. But, um, and I specifically stayed away from sort of Burns' transformation. I'm trying yeah. really hard not to talk oh, about it. Oh, no, I feel like it's not a spoiler to talk about it, so. so I, but I so desperately want to talk about it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, so Vern undergoes this transformation in the text. And she grows an exoskeleton, right? Yeah. But she also has this connection to the earth that's sort of um, through mycelium, right? Yeah. And, so, and I was thinking about, okay, so very hardness, a hard bone, and then this very soft kind of, you know, sort of connection with the tendrils, the mycelium. And so yeah. how, how did you bring those two things together? I think, again, it's that metaphor, right? Of like that softness and hardness that's in all of us. And I think we all have we we all have a human need i think to protect ourselves mm -hmm. and that's where the hardness comes in but we also have to connect we're like social creatures we cannot be you know maybe perhaps there are a few exceptions to this but we cannot be isolated we cannot be without support and without family or community of some sort to bring us together. So that kind of, that, that comes out here. Um, and, but on the one hand, I think I just wanted Vern to be superhuman. Like, I just wanted that for her. I was like, you, you deserve this girl. <laughs> um, and, um, and I wanted her to have a chance because she's, she doesn't, and for good reason, isn't the most trusting person. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to give her an opportunity to be able to, to connect and to feel this kind of grand web of life around her. Mm -hmm. 
So, so to both connect and protect yourself. I, I love it. It was absolutely awesome. And I'm always thinking what the film will, you know, like <laughs> who can, who can Me do too. that? I'm always thinking that. I was like, who can do that? So um, I look forward to that at, at, at some point, but I love her. She's such a unique character. And then you do make her superhuman. You do have this, this transition, but at the same time, she just becomes more of herself. Yeah. Um, I love that connection that, you know, that she, that in that absorption, in that ability to connect with the earth, she also can connect with people's memories. And so I thought, I thought that was fabulous, but I'm going to stop now and, and ask a question from, from the audience. So okay. this is the question from Steph. It's a question for both of us. Rivers, who do you see your work in conversation with? Other writers, artists, and as a scholar, she asks, who do I see your work in conversation with? So, so who do you think you're in conversation with? It's so difficult because in a lot of ways it's the very expansive, you know, answer of, you know, everything I've ever read and absorbed. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I, when I get specific, I feel like I just say the same things kind of over and over again. But it's like, it's like, I, I would say absolutely like Octavia Butler, for example, like mm -hmm. I'm actually just thinking about the starting scene of Fledgling. And I think if I'm, if memory serves, she's like kind of, I don't know if she's like in a cave, but she's kind of emerging, you know, in the woods and kind of there's, it is a kind of a story about like this kind of transformation and mm -hmm. um, this kind of monstrousness um, happening. So I think there's that. I think, um, and I'm just like, do I just list my favorite writers? That's the I kind think of- so, because that's <laughs> actually the next question. The next yeah, question okay. says that you you use texts like Giovanni's Room and you use a text yeah. from Ursica, Ursica Ursula K. Le Guin. So mm -hmm. who are your, who do Arthur's that you love? And we see you bringing them into the text. Yeah. Some of your favorites. Um, yeah. Well, he, I mean, I love, I, I'm inspired by a lot of poetry. Um, I love, love, love Langston Hughes. Um, I use um, the Negro Speaks of Rivers um, in the book. It's kind of a, a small motif. And it's also how I named myself Rivers. Mm -hmm. um, I love his work so much. I love a lot of the Harlem Renaissance writers and poets. Um, I love Nella Larson. I love, going a bit later, I love Lorraine Hansberry, mm -hmm. um, Gwendolyn Brooks. Um, I don't know. I'm definitely like in this phase of I'm rooting for everybody black kind of phase of, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah. Um, those those are definitely a few and I'm trying to think more contemporary um and I, I mean I, I already mentioned Colson I, I have, actually have mentioned I mentioned it before but um Colson Whitehead I love I love Victor Laval um I love Caitlin Greenidge um who wrote I think we love you Charlie Freeman is the name sorry I'm just going to randomly suggest that you all read that book um just because it really stuck with me um and yeah yeah mm -hmm. and and I will um say that that one of the things I would I would if I were planning a syllabus I would put your work in conversation of course with Octavia Butler I love your research you can tell how much research you had to do in order to create your text and that certainly was one of her monikers is that she did so so much research to open up people's worlds so much. Um, I also see Nettie Okorafor in that mm -hmm. sort of a traumatic issues that yes. color trauma in the body, um, mm -hmm. I think is certainly present. And an author that people probably don't remember very much, Virginia Hamilton. And Virginia wow. Hamilton was um, called a young adult fiction writer, but really, I think, you know, beginning in the 70s, uh, she creates this character who, um, sort of has to, because of the trauma of slavery, has to kind of bury herself in the dirt. And what's the name of this? Virginia Hamilton is the writer. Uh -huh. And she, uh, she has a text called The People Could Fly. Oh, so yes. Her, yeah, and she, um, and she has a character named Zeely. And in her work though, she just creates this, this character who kind of, uh, who's, a, who's a kind of godlike character who, who goes away, you know, sort of buries herself in the dirt. And when she wakes up, slavery has happened. Mm -hmm. and just trying to figure out what to do about that and the trauma of that. Because I know that as a reader, an avid reader as a child, but also very much aware 
um, and, and a speculative fiction reader. I love science fiction. Yeah. I was always wondering why nobody was ever writing about, um, you know, sort of the, the African diasporic experience and yeah. particularly around the trauma of slavery. Like where were the novels, if you're gonna go back in time, what happens when you go back in time and there's slavery? And then I discovered Octavia Butler, who yeah. answered that question for me. And so those are the kinds of things I think are, are working, uh, that I see your working conversation with, that you're building this opus, um, you know, and in terms of this galaxy of writers who, who, who deal with this type of work. So here's another question. You mentioned being very creative and imaginative from a young age. What are you inspired by? Dreams, movies, authors? And how do you turn these inspirations into words on the page? Um, I am definitely inspired by all of those things, dreams, movies, authors. Um, just being outside and seeing things um, happen. Like, I, I, like, for example, I will like watch a movie and if it's a good movie, I will, it will just be inside of me. And I like definitely like kind of in a like fan way. I think about all of the like alt universes that could have happened and different things. I twist the characters and then I put characters from other things into that. And then it just moves and moves and moves. Um, but as far as how I turn these into inspirations for my own work, I think it's usually not so direct as that. Um, like, of course, you know, everything is, you know, lives inside of me and, and therefore inspires me and comes out. But I don't think I can easily, usually say, okay, this happened. And so now I'm inspired to write this. Um, it does happen every once in a while. Um, a short story that I wrote called Blood is Another Word for Hunger was written because I saw like a really annoying civil war film. Um, and it's like the first scene is just like this enslaved black character uh, who's just been freed getting killed. And it's all about the white women. And it was just like, it was so upsetting. I was like, okay, I need to like rewrite this. Um, um, and so that occasionally happens, but it's not a usual experience. They just, I, I couldn't exactly tell you where the inspirations for my specific stories come from. Mm -hmm. Has the pandemic changed your writing process? It's made me not write. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just getting back into writing. Um, well, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, I was I had to do edits for my for Sorrowland, um, the developmental edits, and so that was extremely trying and challenging, and so. After turning those in, you know, a couple of months late, um, I just decided, I told myself, you know, very explicitly, like, you don't have to write, like, let yourself rest, you know, um, which I stuck to. And I wrote, I wrote one short story. And then I tried to write other things that just didn't happen. And um, starting in January, I've started writing again, because I've gotten a kind of co-writing, co-working group together. And we meet Monday through Friday, every morning. Um, but it's not writing like how I used to, like the speed is much reduced. Um, so um, yeah, that's, it's definitely, it's hard to write. Like, I think everybody's different, but it's hard to produce art um, mm -hmm. under these conditions. Um, and um, hopefully as things potentially change, that will ease up a bit. But I mean, the world is kind of what it is. Um, so there's always these painful, challenging things to, to contend with. I love that you said that you let yourself rest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You have to. You have to, yeah. <laughs> 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 I think um, I know we're coming to the end, but I, I, I did kind of want to ask um, just another question about um, or, or, or a reflection and then have you have you sort of respond to it. Um, you know, I'm so fascinated by I've always been fascinated by shapeshifters like those are my favorites. And, yeah. um, you know, and watching Vern sort of shapeshift as she has her her metamorphosis, um, which which was kind of Kafka like. Um, yeah. I was I was thinking about 
just the, the, the planet that we live on and the metamorphosis that is happening right now. And yes. as we look at Vern's process that, you know, at first it's irritating when she's itching and then mm -hmm. it's painful and then she has a fever and then mm -hmm. she's unconscious for days mm -hmm. and then she wakes up, you know, yeah. and she's this new creature, but she also has to learn what to do with that and how to do with that. And so yeah. for me, in many ways, I saw it as a reflection of our society. And mm -hmm. uh, you know the things we're going through—the very, very painful process of transformation into what we should be and who we can be. Yes. And, and so I appreciated that so much in the character as well. Yeah. No. And I think, I mean, transformation is like something that's been used in literature for you know for a very long time, going sort of back to our like ancient myths and stuff. And I think that is because we recognize and you know it's kind of like you know in the sort of like words of Octavia Butler like you know you know God is change and change is the you know the, the only real thing and how important it is to us and so the metamorphosis in the book acts as you know it's you know a metaphor about the own the personal crises that we go through the own our own like self-becomings and changes um making ourselves that we all have to go through and usually there's pain there's growth there's also a kind of a bit of a trauma metaphor in there and like you know kind of the only way through it is through it um <laughs> kind of thing mm -hmm. um but yes I love that like sort of about the social transformation but also like our our like our earth and you know the which is also constantly moving and changing and shifting and something that's been really helpful for me as we think about things like climate crisis and stuff like that and how like overwhelming and big of a problem that it is, is that idea that I think what we have seen so far with what nature is capable of is that there's still so much possibility even when it seems hopeless um, and I am so sort of heartened by everything I see around me and the growth I see around me and the, the weirdness and resilience um, that is there. And um, that gives me hope. And that's definitely a part of that is like, you know, it's, it's transforming itself. It's being the earth and all of the creatures and beings and plants and bacteria within it as well. Well, I know we've come to the end. I just want to thank you so much for spending mm -hmm, this time, mm -hmm. for giving us an opportunity to meet the author of uh, such fabulous work. Um, I'm so grateful. And I'm just so grateful, you know, like um, as a person who, you know, an English professor, you know, we love words and, <laughs> language and I, you know, it was just so many opportunities for me to love in your text. And I really appreciate that um, right down to your name. And uh, so I'm just so glad that for one Thursday in May, at least for an hour, I, I too have no rivers. Yeah, thank you so much. I love talking with you and I loved your questions and this has been wonderful. And thank you to Wordplay and to everybody who's here. Who's here. And I just wanna remind our audience, um, you know, that we wanna thank all of the wonderful authors who have been a part of Wordplay and thank you to, um, St. Catherine University and the Star Tribune for, for uh, being uh, sponsors for this particular segment. And you will, will be receiving a survey. So please, please fill out the survey so that um, programming can be made um, as spectacular as you would like it to be. So we thank you so much. Again, thank you to our fabulous author, Rivers Solomon for her incredible work and for adding to syllabi across the, the planet. Thank you.